Uh, welcome to this session, Data and Dollars, as part of Data Echo Culture. Uh, I'm very, very pleased uh, to have a wonderful set of guests. I'm Dr. Sarah Diamond. I'm the President Emerita of OCAD University. We're one of the organizers of this conference and very proud to be so. Um, a few things um, just to remind you of. Um, uh, if you want to join the conversation on social media uh, or speak about it, uh, please use the hashtag data echo culture. We do have simultaneous uh, interpretation for the session. You can select your language of choice between French and English by clicking on the option at the top of the video screen. Uh, do feel free to ask questions in French. Uh, you will see that there uh, is a great uh, assistance if you put your questions into chat. Uh, my colleague Alexis will uh, provide them for me, and I also can see them. So ask questions throughout the session. We're going to do our own roundtable and then come back to the Q&A from you. Um, and um, I am going to now uh, provide us with uh, our Indigenous um, land acknowledgement. Although we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we all call home. From coast to coast to coast in Canada, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territories of the Inuit, Métis and First Nations people that call this land home. I'm in Toronto right now, and I'm in the traditional uh, territories of the Mississauga of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe and the Huron-Wendat, but also in a city that's a major gathering place for Indigenous people from all over Canada, including the Métis and Inuit. Uh, please join me to acknowledge the values, perspectives, languages and cultures that can guide and inspire us, the role of Indigenous people as guardians and stewards of the land, and to consider how we are and each can in our own way, trying to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So thank you very much. So a brief uh, introduction uh, to our uh, fantastic panel of guests, and then we're going to, uh, to start the conversation with them. Um, first of all, it's a great pleasure to uh, let you know a bit about uh, Kelly Wilhelm, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for the Canadian Media Fund. She's a bilingual strategist with more than 20 years of experience leading innovation and change in Canada's creative industries, arts and culture. She's led major policy uh, and strategy initiatives to respond to disruption, capitalize on opportunities for growth and secure new investment. And she brings to the role extensive experience in stakeholder and government relations at the most senior levels. Um, recently, she has uh, been an independent strategist, but she also has uh, advised uh, executive teams at the Banff Centre for Arts and Creativity, the National Arts Centre, City of Toronto, and National Gallery of Canada. She was the senior policy advisor to the Minister of Canadian Heritage, and she also was, before that, the director of policy planning and strategic foresight at the Canada Council for the Arts. So that is Kelly. Uh, we have two colleagues from the Canada Council joining us. First of all, Lisanne Johnson, the director of strategic granting initiatives. She uh, is uh, responsible for the delivery of funding that supports the digital transformation of the arts sector in Canada. Prior to joining the council, she worked in the theatre community as a director and dramaturge with a passion for creating new Canadian plays. She served as artistic director of the Great Canadian Theatre Company and was the artistic associate and literary manager of the National Arts Centre English Theatre prior to that. Gabrielle Zamfir Enosh, who's the director of research and measurement and data ana analytics at the Canada Council, uh, works has worked at the council for... Uh, 13 years, and he is responsible for data collection, reporting on results, strategic planning, and uh, the council's commitments. He's also brought in a culture of data analysis and visualization to that uh, important uh, uh, agency. Alistair Evans is the head of knowledge and research from Creative Scotland, and he is responsible for commissioned research, evaluation, and data strategy. He has a background in social research and has worked with public policy areas before he specialized in culture and creative sectors. He currently sits on the COVID impact steering group on the Center for Cultural Value and UK Research Excellence Framework uh, Panel for Art and Design. And Michael Trent 
is the Director of Performing Arts at the Metcalf Foundation. Uh, he joined Metcalf as Director of Performing Arts in 2015. Over Michael's 30-year career, he's contributed to the development of the dance field as a choreographer, performer, teacher, artistic director, curator, and arts community activist and volunteer. He spent eight years as the artistic director of Toronto's Dance Makers and the Centre for Creation. He's frequently consulted and collaborated with artists and arts organizations at the local and national levels. Issues including strategic planning, transition, curatorial expertise, artistic assessment and training. So we have a fantastic panel. Um, I've introduced them in terms of their um, their history and their current roles, but um, we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, each of them will share uh, a bit of how they're thinking about data from the perspective of either their agency or their foundation. And we're going to start with Kelly. Over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Is it is the sound is good? Bien sûr. Merci. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation. This has been a, a great event already. I enjoyed the process yesterday and look forward to today. As Sarah mentioned, I am the Chief Strategy Officer at the Canada Media Fund. For those of you that don't know us, we are a not-for-profit organization that delivers funds from governments and from revenues from cable and satellite providers in the country. And we do that in order to finance, foster, and promote audio visual content made by Canadians for Canadians to see on Canadian services. So that's essentially us in a nutshell. We deliver about $350 million worth of funding annually. Uh, we're a fairly small core team of about 30 plus people uh, in our core staff. And then we work with Telefilm Canada who ha with whom we have a services agreement to actually administer our programs. And that's another 70 or so folks on that side. So that's essentially what we do. And in those words I've just said, you can imagine how many of those terms are opening, changing, and shifting. Everything from the screen content itself, the platforms on which Canadians access that content, and the place of the Canadian broadcast system within that model. The model that we have today for our funding has two different parts. One is very much focused on television and linear content. The other is focused on interactive digital media content, everything from AR, VR, apps, et cetera. And that uh, interactive digital media part is a bit is quite a bit smaller in terms of the amount of funding we do. So a lot of our money is on the television and linear side. That model of funding and the data we use to decide, measure, evaluate, that model is about 15 years old. So data and the data shift to the moment we find ourselves in is really fundamental because we are in the process at the CMF this year of looking towards building a new program model for what we do, which requires us to look not only at have we been doing it right up until now, but the bigger question of are we now doing the right thing? to achieve the kinds of objectives that we're there to, which is all about, from the cultural perspective, making sure that Canadians have access to Canadian content, specifically in genres that likely wouldn't succeed in the marketplace without some federal help. So this is focused mostly on four areas, which are drama, kids and youth content, variety and performing arts content, and documentary. So that's really the, the place that we are, are active on the linear side. So we're asking ourselves a lot of questions. And the reality is that the current data sets that we have can answer some of them, but certainly cannot tell us where we need to go in a full, fulsome way. So I'll talk a little bit throughout the panel today around some of the, the pieces that we have had in the past. Numeris and other audience tracking systems are obviously one of the big pillars of what we've used in the past. There are gaps there. Um, there were some good conversations about that yesterday on the equity and diversity panel. We've also, though, been an organization that consults every year and every second year we do a deep dive consultation with the industry. And so I want to balance the piece around the data data side, which is both quantitative and, and some qualitative, with that notion of being connected to industry. And that connection to industry this year has changed and shifted. We've done a consultation that has just concluded with over a thousand folks from the industry coast to coast to coast. And so we're going to have to pair up, right, what we're seeing in the data sets, the gaps, and the direction that we're hearing from the folks who are working in the industry directly. 
Um, so I'll talk a little bit, I, I, I imagine, throughout this panel about knowing what we know, <laughs> not knowing what we don't know, and trying to create environments where those kinds of explorations can happen, where the data kind of meets the reality of the practice in the industry, right, and what is needed to going forward from here. So I can stop there and just pass it to, to Sarah to invite the next panelist to speak. Yeah, Kelly, um, you raised a whole series of questions that we're going to, you know, really dig into as we dig into the data as we move through through our dialogues. I'm going to turn to the Canada Council now and ask um, the duo to uh, introduce their work with uh, with data. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in with a um, a, a quick. Um description of the Canada Council and uh, kick us off in terms of how Council collects data and why. Um, I would like to note that our the Canada Council offices are located in Ottawa on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, um, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. Um, so the Canada Council, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're Canada's public arts funder. We have a mandate to foster and promote the study and enjoyment of and production of of works in the arts. Um, that uh, takes the form of, uh, of funding, of course, but it, we also administer a suite of prizes to artists and scholars, and we manage uh, an art bank, which is a collection of over 17,000 works by over 3,000 Canadian artists. And little known facts, the Council also operates the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. Uh, in terms of data, um, uh, CCA, we collect and report on data in many different ways, and um, uh, my colleague uh, Gabrielle will be able to uh, give you more background on that. I will maybe kick this off to just um, uh, say that in 2017, Council shifted from a disciplinary-based um, arts funding model to an outcomes-based program model. So all of our big non-disciplinary bucket programs and strategic funds have a logic model. Um, those, that logic model has objectives uh, with short-term and long-term outcomes. And that logic model informs um, the program design and it also informs our reporting. So we collect uh, qualitative and quantitative information about how our funding project, how our funded projects um, contribute to the objectives of um, the different components uh, and outcomes of the program. Gab? Hello, everyone. Bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this panel, Sarah, and to all the participants, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Gabriel Zanfier Enash. He, him, his director of research, measurement, and data analytics at Canada Council. Uh, as Lisanne said, in 2017, the transition, as uh, the new funding model started, uh, was implemented and um, de developed and implemented by the Council for the Arts Community. The direct impact for us in research was to reconsider and reposition the entire uh, activity the, uh, by the section from a output reporting approach to a more integrated, we name integrated reporting approach that consider outputs, outcomes, and qualitative impact. I know it sounds very uh, technical. I will say a few words about that approach. Outcomes, who receive grants from the council, who is our audience, who are the service and arts organizations that we serve. Out, outcomes, what is the impact, what is the value of the funding provided by the council to the arts community. Qualitative impact, what is the value for public funding for art, for arts community, for Canadians and uh, public in general, the world. Uh, very important as part of the transformation in order to respond to the strategic needs of the Council and uh, provide evidence for decision making, uh, new approaches for research were implemented and data collection were implemented, were issues of decolonization, equity, diversity and inclusion, anti-racism, in this context, measuring COVID-19 impact became very important in our project. And 
uh, support us in developing collaborations and partnership with the community for shared knowledge with the community and also with the final goal for all of us to demonstrate the value of the public investment in the end. So, and more details about our approach during this panel. Okay, yes, you, for sure. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go there. Alistair, over to you. Hi, you can hear me, hopefully. Um, so for those of you who don't know who Creative Scotland are, we're the National Development Agency for the Arts, Screen and Creative Industries in Scotland. So although we grew out of the Scottish Arts Council, we have that um, wider remit and we see ourselves as a development agency, although we disperse about £75 million in grants annually. Um, this year, that's been more like about £140 million with emergency funding on the top of our uh, regular funding. We have 120 regularly funded organisations um, who are on a three-year um, funding horizon, and then we have open project funding and more targeted development funding. And we collect data across um, all of those funds, partly because we are uh, funded from two different sources, from the Westminster Government uh, through the National Lottery and from the Scottish Government directly as a, a devolved area of policy. Um, for the Scottish Government. In terms of what we require um, of our funded organisations and how we work with them on data, um, I'll speak th throughout today, I guess, about two levels of that. Um, there's what we ask for from the organisations and then uh, what we expect of them in terms of uh, the work they're doing with their own audiences. Um, and that really works across economic, social and cultural outcomes. So we're looking at, for data in all three of those areas. Um, when I say outcomes, we're, we're probably still uh, too output focused and we are on a journey, uh, much like uh, as just described by the Canada Council, to move towards a much more outcome focused approach. Uh, normally, uh, that would be clearly drawn when we have novel programmes or high value programmes or high profile uh, cultural events like the cultural programme for the Commonwealth Games, for example, in, in 2014. But our kind of ongoing um, annual reporting from our regularly funded organisations and our project uh, reporting is uh, still too focused on outputs. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of work trying to move that on and trying to grapple with uh, some of the issues that I'm sure will, will come up, the difficulty of digital engagement um, and the questions of what measured uh, on what, what we refer to as equality, diversity and inclusion. I'll probably leave it there. There's much more to come. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, Michael, now from, you know, we've heard from agencies, so it's really great to hear a foundation perspective and you have a significant impact on the arts in, in Canada. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, very much for the invitation. It's so great to be with such wonderful uh, colleagues. Uh, the Metcalf Foundation is a private family foundation. We are based in Toronto, Canada. We were founded in 1960, and our assets are around $177 million, and we generate in the Performing Arts Program around uh, $2 million per year. So we are a small player, uh, certainly compared to our national funding partners on this call. Uh, the foundation has three focus areas. Uh, in addition to supporting the performing arts, we also support the environment sector, and we also work uh, in social services uh, uh, with a particular emphasis on low-income workers. Uh, specifically in the performing arts, we uh, support individual leadership through an internship program and our Johanna's Metcalf Performing Arts Prizes, Le Prix Johanna Metcalf des Alles de la Seine, and then we also support organizational innovation, which is a multi-year strategic funding program currently called Staging Change. Um, in terms of our data, data usage and collection, I'll, I'll say that we do not lead with data in our grant making. Uh, although it's fair to say that it does show up in various ways in our work. And although we do not have a foundation-wide or a standard, uh, standardized approach to around data use across our three focus areas, I'd say that we really rely on learning as our primary instrument to determine success. And that both is for our grantees and for the foundation more broadly. So some of the questions we're asking, asking ourselves is how can we help the sector meet its ambitions? 
Uh, and in order for us to do that, we're looking for the right balance between curriculum-based, theme-specific, or unrestricted grant making. And I think it's fair to say that each of these particular modalities require different kinds of uh, data gathering and analysis. Um, finally, I'll just say that we are a pretty small team, um, so we face capacity issues ourselves around data. And of course, uh, there's a flip side to this issue, which is around the burden of data collection itself on our grantees. Um, and this was uh, a question that we would constantly ask ourselves both prior to the pandemic and certainly during these very difficult times. Um, but we think that funders are becoming certainly or should become more sensitive uh, to and aware of the obligations that data collection um, can impose on grantees. Uh, one of the germane questions that comes up for us is how important is the data? Uh, what are we using it for? Um, what is the obligation that we're imposing in order to achieve it? And what are the right balance or harmony between those uh, different uh, needs? Um, and if, in fact, the data collection is onerous, should we be thinking about supporting our grantees in the efforts? And, and what are the ways to do that? So those are just some of the leading curiosities that we have at the moment around data collection at Metcalf. So, Michael, um, that's a perfect lead into the next question. So thank you for setting us up, uh, which is, uh, you know, we've heard a little bit about what you want to measure as um, granting agencies or foundation. So now let's talk about what data, in fact, you expect um, those that you fund to provide you with, where that sits versus data you might be collecting yourself, um, you know, as agencies, if, if any, um, and how this is shifting. So, you know, it's sort of a set of related questions because um, I know that some of the focus certainly for the CMF has been quantitative, i.e., you know, what's the number of people in the audience? And yeah, we're also, and, and same with the Canada Council, right? So, but we're also, and I imagine Scotland, but now we're hearing that there's way more interest in qualitative data, i.e., what are the impacts of the experience on audiences? Is it how are these arts organizations or cultural industries changing society? Much harder to um, gather the, the data, much harder to have the right tools for that. So, um, so what are you asking of people? What are you gathering and how do you balance the qual and the quant? Uh, who'd like to, anyone wanna jump in here to start it off? I'm going to go to the Canada Council because I know that you've been kind of immersed in this, and then we'll we'll send the questions around. Turn your audio on, please, Gabe. Thanks. My apologies is that buttons and settings that don't work, won't work. Uh, great point, uh, uh, Michael, mentioning what is the role of the funders, public or private, in data collection, and how, as a funder, we can be more strategic and responsible in our data collection, and how we can increase the collaboration in the data sharing respecting, of course, the confidentiality and privacy of the information that we collect. It's one of the principles that we can, we cannot, um, we have to consider in all our approaches that we put in place, but that role of responsabilization of the funders in collection and dissemination, I think, is critical. Uh, related to your question about what to collect, when, and especially why, from the council perspective, as I said, the four years represented a major shift in our data collection approaches. We put in place a process that reflects the granting flow, starting with who registered in our portal, who submit an application. And the question is, why are you interested in that information or data? We are interested to know how we serve our community, how we increase accessibility to our programs to the arts community. So who apply? Who submit an application and who get a grant? Again, from the perspective of equity, inclusion, regional funding, it's important to have access to a, a picture, a snapshot, who are our successful candidates? Moving forward, it's collecting data at the time of activity reports. We name final reports 
or interim reports, depending on the stage of the funding. So those type of qualitative data that we collect as part of the activity reports help us to uh, measure the value, the audience, the impact of our grants for our recipients. And moving forward, we have the qualitative impact that where the collaboration with other, other funders and players in the art sector, outside the sector, is becoming absolutely critical to be able to measure and re report on intrinsic value of the arts and culture for the society. So, uh, and I gave an example how in this context, new approaches for research are very important. Decolonization our method, research methodologies, data, data processes are critical if you want to capture the value of our funding for other communities. The best example is indigenous arts and culture community and what processes we can put in place to engage that community in the research a project respecting the self-determination and sovereignty of indigenous people. And as an example, for today, we thought a, a, a great, I would say, study case with a few examples of the impact and how we use the data to the digital strategic fund. One of the, I would say, most important uh, initiative put in place by the council to support the digital transformation. So I will pass to, uh, to Lizan for that. Uh, for those aspects of the impact. Actually, Gabe, before before you pass yeah. it along, um, you said something very important about uh, methodologies and working with Indigenous audiences um, uh, and uh, also makers. Could you talk about what the actual tools are, um, some of the ways that that's maybe different from traditional ways of collecting data? And then we'll go to Lisan. Yeah, I, I, I the first step in that process and was a great learning experience for me was let the place to indigenous artists to speak about the value of public funding for their community. Don't come with Western-based approaches, notion of the value, notion of the impact. So. For that research project, our section really plays an administrative role. So we had we created an advisory circle with indigenous consultants and representatives of the community. To an RFP process, were open to indigenous community, Archipel, one of the research based, uh, indigenous research based firm was selected. The entire process of engaging with indigenous community was made by indigenous artists and players in the sector. So for us was an experience where we have to step back and create a project for with indigenous community. The methodologies that are creating and the ways that they conduct in the survey and the focus groups are completely different for the, I would say, Western-based research approaches. Great, thank you. That's a, it's really helpful to kind of get concrete on some of this stuff. So um, uh, over to you, Lisan. Sure, I'll try to be brief. Um, we thought it might be interesting to just give the Digital Strategy Fund as a bit of an example in terms of how we're collecting data to inform decision making. Um, so the Digital Strategy Fund was a time limited fund that actually wrapped up at the end of March a significant investment of over 88.5 million uh, in the arts sector over four years to support digital transformation. And uh, the council has every intention of continuing to support uh, digital transformation through its uh, current uh, recently launched strat plan. So we're really kind of trying to look back at, at the digital strategy fund in order to understand uh, through data um, what's worked so that we can inform the design of new initiatives. So just a few examples of how how we're using data. Um, some of that kind of really basic quantitative data um, is available uh, that we collect at a profile level, at an application level, is actually available to um, directors live through a Power BI application with uh, data visualizations built in. So that's kind of data we always have uh, access to. Um, but uh, in terms of evaluation activities, we've done a number of things with the, um, with the Digital Strategy Fund. We've done an, actually a qualitative analysis 
analysis of the uh, all successful applications. Um, that's helped us understand certain things in terms of the types of impacts that people are hoping to have through their projects. Um, that led us actually to a partnership mapping exercise where we actually used Power BI and we mapped all, because you have to have a partner, um, uh, their collaborative initiatives and their partnerships uh, associated with these applications. So we mapped um, and did a visualization of all of the partnership mapping uh, in digital strategy fund projects. And it was amazing. We thought we found that there were like 31 partner countries and, you know, um, you know, 260 applications led to like 3,000 partners in 31 different partner countries. And we do impact surveys. Um, so for completed projects that gather both quantitative and qualitative uh, information. And we're now in the midst of a formal evaluation uh, of the fund, which will include focus groups, interviews, and additional surveys. Um, and people are uh, compensated for their uh, focus group and interview time. Great, thank you very much, Kelly. I'm gonna to go to you next for um, the questions, which are again, what do you ask your grantees to collect? What do you collect? And what's the qual quant balance in that? So we're, we're quite different from uh, an arts council model in that we support for-profit companies. Uh, so that's sort of the, the point of departure for how we work and collect the data. We work both in the linear television side and, as I mentioned, interactive digital media, but the, the clients, the recipients of the funding are small, usually small to medium-sized uh, for-profit production companies working in one or more area of media production. Um, so they typically have a relationship that you'd expect of a grant or grantee where they give us the data about the project, the intention. We collect quite a lot of qualitative information as well as some um, quantitative, increasingly around um, who they're working with, particularly around gender um, and also around equity and inclusion. We're making quite a few changes this year to really up the, the, the standardization and the precision around reporting uh, where we weren't collecting data on these these uh, areas before. So I think we can probably get into that a little bit more later. But the, the majority of the data that we use in decision making actually comes from the broadcasters themselves. Our model at the moment on the linear television side, which is about 80% of what we fund, so I'll, I'll focus there for a minute, is that we have what's called performance envelopes that are allocated to about 25 broadcasters working in both the French and English and other languages. APTN is a good example, the Aboriginal People's Television Network. And each one of those broadcasters receives an envelope of funding that they have access to each year from us. There are qualifying things that are required to become one of those 25 broadcasters. And there's a series of metrics that we use, mostly around audience, uh, but also now getting into things like to what extent are the uh, productions you're commissioning inclusive of women, for example. So we have some specific metrics around gender parity that we include in that calculation. And this year, we've also made a change to look at the inclusion of equity-seeking groups within the leadership and creative teams of the productions commissioned. So the way it works today, those broadcasters collect and submit to us every year all of the data on the productions that, that we are financing. They're the ones that decide which shows get greenlit though. So the CMF does not actually decide which shows get made. So that's a really important point of clarity and again, quite different from the Arts Council model. And then at the at the sort of third party side, we have Numeris, which is the biggest data collector for total hour, hours tuned and other audience statistics around who is actually watching the content that's made. And that itself is a, a model that, again, is, is looking at evolving in certain ways, but certainly there are gaps within the numeris structure right now in regional gaps in terms of coverage for where the data is coming from and which audiences are captured and which are not, and very much on um, socio-demographic and ethnocultural um, indices. So very much missing a sort of precision around equity and the, the other issues that are really of concern to us at this point. All that to say, because of the gaps and the nature of the system, when you put all of that up against where we are today in a multi-platform universe where Canadians are getting their content from anywhere in the world on multiple platforms and where they're making these choices very much outside of our traditional broadcast system a lot of the time, we're in a moment of fundamental shift, right? In all of what we do, starting at the level of asking what is what does it mean for Canadians to access this content? And from whom should they be accessing it? Which leads us directly to the question of how do you measure consumption on those other platforms? 
So that's where we are today. So we're looking at for specifically linear content that goes streamed online or through other um, other services, as well as digital media content that can happen across a proliferation of platforms. Our challenge at the moment is how do you capture consumption of those products or those, you know, those pieces of content that we're funding in the multi-platform universe? How do you get any kind of precision around what that means is the next question, right? So we are very much at how do you look at a single piece of content, for example, on the digital media side, a game, video game created by a Canadian company, an indie company that is then distributed mostly through Steam or another online platform, right? But also gets picked up in other ways. So we're looking at having to put together a picture of how these pieces of content are being consumed both domestically and internationally. And we're looking at putting, it requires a sense of all the different sources that are out there in the world, the data being collected, and trying to harmonize some of those data sets to get a meaningful picture of where our funded projects are being picked up and where they're performing. That all sits in sort of our media analytics world, which is one of the teams that reports to me. And I would just say before moving on, a lot of the qualitative work that we do sits on our industry and market trends team side, which also reports to me. And that is where we commission research. We work in partnership with many different organizations to try to then unpack sort of the meaning and the gaps that we have in the research, in the data collection that we do. And that side in a moment of transformation like this is extremely important in trying to help us to get our hands on the data that we need to make decisions about where our fund should go in the future. So I'll stop there. A yeah, lot. no, thanks a lot. And, you know, Alistair, I remember in, in our conversations, um, you know, you, you talked about the interesting kind of tension in um, evaluating arts organizations that really are in the not-for-profit sector right through and across many dimensions of, of different kinds of disciplines right through to for-profit um, industries. So, uh, again, if you could sort of touch on, you know, those questions, what do you collect? What do you expect people to collect? Um, and we had heard from Michael that it can be onerous, in fact, uh, you know, uh, for some smaller organizations, for example, to collect. And then, um, you know, uh, you know, how are you looking at the qualitative quantitative piece? Sure. Um, I think, uh, well, I think we have to start with what what's meaningful, and that's how we'll always look at, to take a decision to collect anything, um, going back to Michael's point, is we recognise the burden on organisations that we fund. Um, quite a lot is being pushed towards us uh, by government um, and by legislation requiring, um, quite rightly, uh, quite requiring us to collect data in certain areas. And then we would take a decision whether that's best served by a quantitative or a qualitative methodology. Um, in many cases, the quants aren't there um, to work with. In, in others, um, there have been um, really good advances. To, just to give an example, um, the Social Mobility Commission in the UK has developed a measure um, of inclusion and social mobility, which asks about parents' occupation at age 14. And so it's a very targeted question. And is in some ways counterintuitive when you, you first hear it, but actually is stress tested. And we may well use that actually as a, as a shortcut to what was previously uh, work that we would have done um, in focus groups and the reporting would have been um, qualitative. Um, in other areas, uh, we would look particularly to, to qualitative methodologies and uh, building a logic model and seeing what we, uh, what outcomes we, we're trying to engender in society, and that's more likely across uh, areas like um, health and well-being, and uh, community cohesion, and, and other areas where we have ambitions for um, the money that we uh, give to the organisations that we fund. Um, so really, it's I don't want to say it's it's horses for courses, but um, it's also it's also a real blend, and I think that's important. We would we would look always to be triangulating uh, both of those things. I think the issue for us is that the quantitative element has often not been done particularly well. So in our work with the audience agency, we are trying to roll out consistency across the sector in Scotland in terms of uh, what is done at an audience level, um, and to me that's 
that's a very simple first step to make sure, um, you know, at my level, I'm not working with 120 different data sets as I have been in the past. And getting those points right allows us uh, to build advocacy to help people with their um, benchmarking to build geographic or art form groupings. Um, and that then people start to see those benefits. And that's when that burden um, that they feel from our monitoring and evaluation starts to, to pay dividends. And, you know, we begin to win those hearts and minds. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's, that's really uh, a very, very important point about the kind of collaborative efforts and data sharing. Um, Michael, I want to go to you, and I know you, you've you talked about some of, you know, the frankly, the limitations um, in your own act, in the foundation's activities around data collection. Um, maybe if you could share a little bit about, you know, what you do do, what you have, but maybe um, before we go to the audience, maybe kick off a bit of a sense of what you've what you've been seeing as trends, you know, in the last uh, kind of year and a half with the COVID-19 context and any other trends that you are seeing from the uh, qualitative data that you do collect and from the kind of um, testimonials that you're seeing to kind of lead us into our next levels of discussion. Sure. Um, it, you know, I think that my answer to the, to the question is, is what do we gather and, and what do we do with it? Is It really depends. It depends on the nature of the program. It depends on the nature of the, of the offering that we're making as a foundation. We don't do operational funding. And I think there's a whole other set of, of expectations when you're, when you're providing operating funding to an organization to deliver uh, the significance of its impact for its communities. We, we work in two very specific areas, uh, individual uh, uh, leadership through an internship program, which is a whole different set of questions, which is what are you trying to learn? Um, what, how does your career want to change? And so that manifests in very anecdotal um, and sort of personal um, narrative uh, ex around the experience of, of learning and acquiring new skills. From the organizational perspective, we're looking at innovation and we're, we're thinking of um, creating a container for organizations to um, address a piece of complexity, a challenge that they've identified as something that they're, they're grappling with, that they want to try and, and move the needle, so to speak. And because it's so bespoke for each organization in terms of what they're working on, we don't want to say to them in advance that these are the metrics that you need to apply. What we say to them is, tell us what success means for you. Tell us what those measures of success will look like based on your ambitions. And then we hold them to... Not to, uh, to, not to the record, but we, then we want to hear what that experiment was like. We very much believe in the notion that failure is a part of a learning journey and that we want to create space for folks to feel that they can authentically and genuinely speak about what didn't happen or what didn't emerge uh, based on what they had sort of intended at the very beginning. Um, and I, I can share with you one very, very quickly one tool that we use, which I call the W3, which many folks will be familiar with this. It's an active learning and action learning strategy, which asks three questions. What, so what, now what? And in this kind of learning paradigm, we're saying, uh, you know, typically in, in, in the reporting mechanisms, we want to say, uh, check to see whether an organization does what they said they were going to do. We feel that that's not enough. It's not enough for us to learn. As a foundation, it's not enough that we hope for the organizations to move their ambitions forward. So then we ask them to think and reflect, so, so, so what? What is the underlying principles or, or uh, learning that, that emerged from these actions that they did with respect to this challenge that they want to tackle? And then more importantly, we say, so what? What are the next modalities that are going to move you forward, the next directions that are going to help you unpack and deepen this change that what you want to create in your community. In, in, in terms of, and then that's the sort of the frame of, of learning that we work with at the foundation, certainly the performing arts uh, program. In terms of shifts and things that we're seeing that's changing, we're noticing an enormous fatigue um, among the sector in very, very significant ways. And uh, to my earlier point around the burden of data collection, we, I think, address that first by saying, uh, we leave it to them, we leave to the organization the, the, the agency to determine what those metrics are on their own. So that removes a kind of burden of trying to meet an, an outside expectation, but that's more directly connected to the 
organizational culture that is at play in, in any specific sort of innovation or pursuit. So we're noticing fatigue. We are noticing that folks don't necessarily have the skills to understand or to approach data collection in a certain way. So I think that's one of the questions that we're asking is what strategies do we need to put in place in order to help organizations um, identify what those data metrics can be and then how to help them collect them. And then more importantly, what do you do with them once you've, once you've brought those into your sort of purview. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have only about three or four minutes left and we have a great question from the audience. You guys, have, you folks have given just great, great, great things for us to think about. But from Frédéric Julien, the quality of funders metrics regarding equity depend largely on individuals, applicants, self-identification as members of an equity seeking group. Do you have a sense that the vast majority of applicants are indeed self-identifying? In brackets, I know it's difficult to identify people who do not identify, but I presume you must be gathering anecdotal information. Um, so a quick round on this. Um, Kelly, maybe a note from you, because I actually know that Richard Koo, who was on the panel yesterday, CMEP's doing a lot of uh, work actually to find standardization and categories for one. So if you could talk quickly, and then we're just going to do a round, and then I think we're going to have to end our fabulous panel. So Kelly. Sure, so a great question, Frederick. thanks. Um, a couple of things. I'd say that the, the only way to know if we know enough is to work with organizations that represent the communities that we're interested in learning more about. Um, so it's the starting point for us has been partnership, both with our funding agency colleagues across the country, um, but also bringing to the table and providing some sector, sector development funding to some organizations that are forming in the media sector representing specifically racialized communities. So for example, we're, we're funding and working closely with the Black Screen Office, um, with the Racial Equity Media Collective, whose mandate is specifically around data and research by and from the community of media creators that are ethnoculturally diverse. Um, so I think there, there is no other way to do this work uh, credibly and with a sense of what we're actually accessing being correct, true, or in some way meaningful, right, to the communities themselves. The question earlier raised around and transparency of for what and why are we collecting this data is equally important. And I would say one thing that um, that I, you know, I think we all need to ask ourselves as funders is I think we've all had different approaches in the past to how we ask for self-identification and from whom. And at this point where we are is it is really at the moment where self-identification by all is really the only way to get to reasonable data sets on the distribution of who we fund, right? So as opposed to saying, we're gonna do a targeted program for this community, you must be part of this community. Those things will still happen, I suspect, because the distinct needs will still be there. But for the bulk, the baseline funding stats, we actually need to know, are you white? <laughs> are you coming from a, an ethnocultural community that you identify yourself differently? And to have appropriate categories that represent all of our applicants coming into the uh, into the system. Fantastic, Michael. Any comments? We we really are down to the wire. So if people could be very brief, thank you, Kelly. That was great. Yeah, I'll just say we don't use self-identification protocols at all across our um, our funding in all three of our programs. It's really through, as um, as Frederic talks about, it's anecdotal information. It's through conversation. This is the, most of our work is done uh, through the process of engaging folks directly because we're working with a smaller dynamic, uh, a smaller group of folks. So self-identified is is not part of our process, um, but we certainly in our internship program, for example, we want to make sure that in the distribution of our grants, there's opportunities for learning that we are looking at some diverse uh, uh, set of criteria that the, um, uh, the folks who receive the funding are, uh, are not just located in the city of Toronto, that there's a diversity of practice, that, there's, that gender is represented um, and that racialized applicants are part of those who receive the funding. So that is more of an intuitive uh, process and I, and I think there is challenges and uh, benefits to that uh, process, but it's something that we continue to investigate about how to do this in a very transparent way. Thank you. Gabe, very quickly. Yeah, very quickly. For self-identification, we put in place a triangulation process. For self-identification of our applicants and recipients, the Council have a long history of collecting data on self-identification. Overall, the response rate is close to 90% of the applicants self-identified. 
Second approach is who receives the grant. Last year, uh, two years ago, we had the Collecting Demographic Data Pilot Project with main organization looking at the diversity and inclusion of their staff and board. Third component, who is the audience? We are adjusting our questions in the application form or the final report to collect uh, information about the target or the audience aspect of the project that serve specific communities. We are revising our self-ID forms for gender and self uh, and culturally diverse questions. Thank you. Um, Alistair, 10 seconds. I'm sorry, very short. It sounds like this is something important for you as well. Um, yes, it is. I'll just say our disclosure rates aren't great. And, you know, we work with organizations um, working with particular groups to try and raise them. And, you know, we have a range of languages at play and we have um, new responsibilities for um, looked after children and new responsibilities for refugees and asylum seekers. So uh, it's a very live issue with us. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much, all of you. Um, please, those of you in the audience, I think a little survey is about to pop up. Um, please uh, join us either for be seen and hear, which is next, or what do funders measure, the next panel I'm about to hop to, and uh, developing your digital strategy with data. So thank you very much to our wonderful panelists. Best of luck in a changing time. We all depend on you and uh, the quality of, of your work. So thank you. I'm going to exit. I think the uh, survey is going to go up. And uh, have a great rest of the day. Bye, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Many Bye. thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.